Hello, this is Dan. This is Daniel Vale, alias Johnny Mac, the Diller, or freshly known as Johnny Mac the Diller, alias the Paradox, and I didn't really give this podcast a name on Podbean. But I had to re re record this video because I did an I did almost an hour long video on on a uh, Twitter dot com or X formerly formerly known as Twitter to to practice to see if it could be shared and it can't be shared so at least I don't know how to share it so. That's how I'm doing it. So I'm gonna re-record it because I can upload it. I can upload a video from this camera app on StreamYard on both YouTube and on um, and on Podbean. So that's what I'm gonna do. Right, as you can see, I tried to mix in yellow with blue to cover up the parts of my of my cheeks where that were left the same color when I decided to paint it. I'm gonna practice something here and I'm sorry I don't mean to look like I don't care but how I look. I care how I look to a degree but I don't care how I I don't care if I look foolish usually. Well, this does not look foolish. This looks like you just. This looks like you have, like you have no self respect. So I'm sorry. I don't mean to look like I don't have any self respect. My hair is so long now that unless I wash it, it can't look straight. So I got naturally curly hair. All right. This episode last time my episode was. Raw vs. Nitro, March 10th, and I did like a three or four part episode about it because I, because I wanted to compare it, I wanted to do a comparison. So this is uh, WCW Uncensored. Like I said, I spoke mostly about this on Twitter Live, but what I will do is when I condense it enough to where I won't... So I can fi I can figure out a way not to take too long. And by the way, when I paint up my face, I usually try to practice being in character. So that's the best way I can do. Like I said, you can see this on Twitter, but I want to do this quicker. The butterfly symbol is a symbol of what a what a full metamorphosis looks like for from i think a worm turns into a caterpillar and a caterpillar turns into a butterfly i think and what that has to do with me personally is a lot of times I go from being real timid or real quiet or um, I think my brother used the term discreet to just hauling off and just sometimes being rude because I just completely lost my temper. When that happens, that's what the paradox is all about. You go from, you go, you have an interchange, I have an interchangeable personality. So the dealer, let's see right here, I have a pair of playing cards. And believe me, look at this, so I have a box right here. It's a, it's a pair of Blue Bicycle Standard Playing Cards. 
So, first, if any, any good card player will deal their own cards when they play by themselves. They'll, they shuffle it the best way they can. So that people they play, so that they play with someone, they'll know exact, they'll do it well enough to where they'll do it and they'll just. I can't see it, but I'm shuffling. And when I do that, I could have an official card shuffler by a device here, but I like to shuffle myself, and that's what I like, like to look at it. Let the games begin. That's how I normally am. But if I could do like I did, that's what the dealer, Johnny Mac, is like. And that's why I put on face paint. So, and that's why I do my best to try to try to make it look like a butterfly. It's to make this point. A regular dealer action would be Are you sure we have to do this? I'm not really sure we need to. I usually, if I'm gonna be the dealer, the uh, that side of my personality would try to avoid every conflict and try to settle it with a card game. That's what like the games begin is for. The dealer, on the other hand, will be like this. All right, you have a problem with me? Let's let's sell it right here and now. That's an example. I can't do. I can't say that in real life because then I would have to get in a conflict and in real life I'm not confrontational but in character I can say I can say almost anything I can think of saying and it can even though I can have even though I'll face a consequence I won't I won't have to nearly face the uh, a dangerous consequence like I would in real life. So that's why it's important to add that part in any character I do. But that's but when you can't take a bump, by the way, the reason I'm trying to be a manager and I created this card gimmick. Car gimmick, where I shuffle, or I shuffle cards, and if y'all ever see me in the background, when people are walking, I'll likely be playing solitaire or a game like that. That's because former WWE and former ECW was both a star in ECW and the WWE in the nineties and. His last match in WWE, at least on TV, in the 2000s, was against Batista. And he had, I saw him on YouTube saying, play up whatever is part of your personality. And I always loved face painting, like I've said before. So, I don't know why, but butterf the butterfly symbol always stood out to me the most. So I thought, why don't I focus on that first? Okay. Okay, and if I could uh, really be honest, the purpose of this podcast 
if not just talk about um, wrestling. It's to practice how I would want to talk, how I would want, how I would plan on talking. If I, if I was to manage someone, and what better way to practice managing or talking before someone than to take interviews or moments that really happened and just and just talk and just respond to it. So that's what part of this podcast is about. Like I the beginning match this topic is gonna to be WCW Uncensored 1997, Part 1. The, the opening match was for the WCW United States Heavyweight title. Dean Malenko and Eddie Guerrero for the title. Most of this is mainly, mostly due to how Eddie Guerrero He was trying to help Dean Malenko the month before in his cruiserweight title defense against Six. Because Six was about to use the title. He was trying to pull it from Six. And anybody who knows anything about Six, alias one, two, three kid, and alias X Pack in the Attitude Era. Anybody who knows anything about him knows he's got hair almost it's actually a little longer than this. Because he actually has more hair than I do. But um, but because of that, all Dean Malenko could do mess with his hair. And if he had kept on messing with his hair, he would have let go. He would have control of the grip of the belt and he could have pulled it from him. But all Dean could think of was that he was pulling the belt. So because he lost the title, he, he, he claimed he thought that Dean was, that Eddie was trying to take the title from him, period. So, throughout the series of two or three weeks, they went back and forth in promos and in matches. Matter of fact, the night after this, he got involved in Eddie's match and cost he and Jericho the match against the Faces of Fear, Haku and the Barbarian. And that's why I think this is such an important match, not just for Dean Malenko and Eddie Guerrero, but it was a real important match in the story. So what I liked was how Randy Anderson, he kept on in the match, they would go back and forth. There was one, I remember, after about 10 minutes of the match, where they are going back and forth because they had such great chemistry together. They went back and forth so much that we didn't know who was going to get the upper hand out of the two until Eddie gave him a running drop kick. Not a straight one, but the sideways, where if it was from the top rope, it would be called a missile drop kick. And he hit it on the left knee. For the rest of the match, he worked on that knee. At one point, he even wrapped Dean's leg around the still post and drop kicked it. And then, and I remember they did a lot of storytelling where they did like they were fussing at each other. And they they even used each other's signature moves as a slap to the face against each other. The best part of the match was when Six came out with his cam. Six came out, but earlier in the match, they had the camera crew let them know something's happening in the back, so they let the camera crew, and they used to do this a lot in those days. They would interrupt a match and show them in a split screen what was happening. Well, actually, they didn't use a split screen that I know of, or if they did, it looked so full length that that you could barely see what's happening in the ring. They showed Rick Steiner laid out in the back and 
Kevin Nash is a real life friend of of uh, Rick Steiner, along with a along with Six and Scott. Did like they had just found him laying out, so they were looking for an ant for the ambulance. And Scott Hall said the Steiner brothers really have been having trouble lately. And I think before that, they even did like they had pushed him off the off the road in a car wreck. And like I told my mom, there is one scene, just that in itself shows how pretend it is because. Number one, there's no way they could get away with that. They get arrested in real life. But more importantly, now knowing that they were friends at that time just shows how predetermined it is. I don't mean to ruin it for anybody that watches it. I just I just think it's interesting when you hear wrestling podcasts like that. Because Kevin Nash, on one of his episodes of his podcast, he's spoke about how he wanted his wife to see Braun Breaker because they they were friends with both Rick Steiner and his wife and their son may the Lord rest his soul used to play with all three of their kids so when he he wanted her to see how Bronson, Rick Steiner, was in the ring because because of their friendship with his parents, and he said, and he is good. So when I heard that, I, I thought, after a while, I thought, oh, that would explain why Rick Steiner let him throw him around and he pretended to have an ear injury from a pretend, from a pretend wreck. They were always friends. So that would explain why he would let him do that. It was to help him continue the story. And um, they went back to the ring. And after a few minutes, they went outside. And the one advantage that the Malenko had was when he was holding himself up against the guardrail. Eddie jumped from the top turnbuckle to meet to reach him, and he hit his side of his his left pectoral muscle and his shoulder or rotator cuff hit the guardrail, so that became a weakness. So he used that as a weakness. The Malenko did to use the frog splash and he said no 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 but he forgot about his injury momentarily so that made it easier for Eddie to use the Texas Cloverleaf submission hold and when that happened finally six and brings me back to the original point six tried to take the US title they got title from six with the referee Randy Anderson pulling Eddie away from him the whole time, so he could not, even though it doesn't matter who uses a weapon, um, he could not do anything to stop, couldn't do anything to stop Dean from using anything or Eddie. So when he saw a camera, he ducked when Eddie went to hit him with the belt, and he hit Eddie instead on the back of the head with the camera, Covered him and got the one, two, three. Up to that point, that was one of the most important wins because he had been a Cruiserweight champion a couple of times before that. So going from the Cruiserweight title to the U.S. title is is how they used to, that used to be like going from the TV title to the U.S. title. So that's how important this was for Dean Malenko. And at this time, I think Eddie needed to turn heels, so this was a perfect opportunity for him. What I liked was the first official segment of the night was Roddy Piper. It was Roddy Piper talk being interviewed by me and Jane about 
the main event. And I'm not always good at sounding like people, but I'm going to try my best in this case because it's so funny. As I recall, he said, My whole life has been uncensored. I don't need to have a match like this to have a championship with match with you in the future, Hogan. And he they went his teammates, Steve McMichael, Benoit, Chris Benoit, and Jeff Jarrett came in to talk with him. Earlier he said, Where's Flair? He's gone. Where's Arn Anderson? He's gone. They're supposed to be my teammates. And I think the Gene said something to the effect of, well, here comes your actual teammates here. And after a couple of minutes, Jeff Jarrett said, we're going to be a unit with the with the real icon. You can believe that. And then Chris Benoit said, the reason you became an icon was by making the right decisions. I don't know why. I guess because of being such a big fan of this pay-per-view. And such a big fan of this pay-per-view, I just remember those things. Now, I'd always found, when they would do interviews with me and Gene, I'd always found that to be the most interesting aspect of professional wrestling. Two people taking a microphone and being interviewed, or not always being interviewed, but talking with someone or against someone or more importantly about someone was always interesting to me. So I think that's why I can remember that because it stands out to me in my memory. And uh, so he said, you said I, right, Piper said, you said I can't trust them, right? And he said, well, what I said is there's dissension from time to time. He said, well, I love it. If I can't trust them, I love it. I love it. And he actually, instead of putting up the four symbol like this, he almost did the middle finger. They said, no, no, it's like this. <laughs> that was the funniest thing. Okay. I usually talk about current wrestling on Vimeo, but because it's uh, 22 minutes and 33 seconds in this video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the end of Raw from this past Monday, and I'm just gonna be honest. I still don't get, still don't get why The Rock is so popular with the fans. I mean, he kept on, he kept on saying, it "Didn't have to be like this. It didn't have to be like this." No follow up. So I don't get it. Another thing I don't get is what happened with all those stars in the back. They're supposed to have a problem with The Rock and Roman Reigns also. Why didn't they come why didn't they come outside to help them? Because you know you have you know you have the Intercontinental Champion, even though they're not associates. He's he could be somebody who could have a problem with The Rock doing that just because there's no, just because of the gimmick that Gun 3 uses. He's always about the respect of the style of wrestling, the traditional style of wrestling. Where it's what you do in the ring and that's the only thing that matters. So, that's why I, that's why I don't understand why even somebody like him was not used. Could They could have also brought out um, Jey Uso. They could have brought out could have brought out virtually anybody that anybody that represents the heavyweight division they could have brought anybody out there to stop him heck they could have even surprised us and brought brought out Dustin for all we knew I don't think they want to do that because AEW is officially a uh, considered their competition, but it would definitely have helped the story, the story right there, the angle or the segment they were doing right there. That could have helped it. I didn't watch all of Raw yet, so I can't say everything that happened. But 
from the looks of things, J.D. McDonough lost to Ricochet, and gotta be honest, J.D. McDonough, I think they kept him too long in the Judgment Day. Really can't think of one, one thing he brought to the group. But that's just me. I don't expect anybody to agree with me. But however, there is a new championship that the WWE is bringing and things like this. So it makes me happy or glad that I stay, that I watch it on, on a DVR and I watch it live when I can. Some kind of some type of new map, new title belts. Kind, I think it's, I think it's similar to the old school TV title. Um, I really like that AW. It's doing an official tag team title tournament to crown new champions. I am a big fan of tournaments, just like I'm a big fan of gimmick matches like ladder matches and cage matches and battle royals. <clears throat> So I like tournament matches, and that's why I can't wait to see um, when I'm finished with this video. I'm going to go in my room, and I'm going to start seeing tonight's episode of AEW. Um, the AEW World Championship, Samoa Joe, believe that AW's website I believe they did they did promote tonight's um tonight's preview let's see hey the first match ever of Kazuchika Okada the Rainmaker ended with him winning the international title thus ending the what I believe is a close to three month Title reign of Eddie Kingston. And also, you know what? And also, um, Trim Beretta and Arch Cassidy won their wild card bout in the Tag Team Title Tournament. And tonight they face FTW Champion Hook and Chris Jericho, the Lionheart. That's going to be interesting to see, especially when they're in Chris Jericho's home country of Canada, Quebec City, Canada, Quebec City, Canada, and the Center Videotron. And also, and also, Will Ospreay and Katsuyori Yuri Shibata face each other. So Strengthen goes one-on-one -on -one with Konosuke Takeshita. Representing the Don Callis family, and Private Party go against the Young Bucks, who are only in this because they're executive vice presidents of AEW. And also, this this um, Saturday night on Collision. In London, Ontario, Canada, the infantry who stayed in the tournament because of help from the, uh, I don't know why it's hard for me to remember that, uh, Jay Briscoe, I think, or is it Mark? I don't know which one is which, but it's, uh, one of the Briscoes that is still alive. <clears throat> He cost um, House of Two Thirds of House of Black their their wild card tournament match against 
the infantry. So the infantry goes against Pride, goes against FTR in the quarterfinals match of the tournament this Saturday night, and so much more. So they, so Shibata and Osprey have faced each other in the past seven times. Ten times, actually. And most of those matches were in either six man tag matches or multi man bouts. But it could have even been eight man tag team matches, for all we know, or ten man tag team matches. And that was all in Japan or Rev Pro. And one was a Rev Pro British Heavyweight title fight on February 11th, which was also won by Shabbat. So that's why that, that's to that, um, Hmm. For a while, it looked like Shibata had his career was over, but four years later, he came back in a G1 Climax three months, three years ago. He, wrought, he shocked the world when he stepped in the ring with Zack Sabre Jr., and it was a grappling rules contest, and I think he won. Then two and a half months later, Wrestle Kingdom 16, Shibata got back into the ring with Green Narita, which was a full blown match. Then ten months later, on November 4th edition of Rampage, two years ago, this year, Shibata made his in ring debut for AEW when he lost to Orange Cassidy and an international title match. So these are some really great matches that they're promoting for tonight's match. So, so, so we go through everything else that both men have done so far. Man. In March of last year, Shibata actually won the Ring of Honor Pure Championship for Miller Yuta. And the next eight months, he tore it up on both AEW and Ring of Honor events. And he even traveled all the way to Ref Pro's 11th anniversary show. And it was actually last November when he lost the Ring of Honor Pure Championship back to U Willer Yuta. And then he returned to Japan, made a monumental return to AEW on the 16th of this month on Collision. And he and Brian Danielson wrestled in a dream match, and it was a certifiable dream match. I saw this on DVR last yesterday as a matter of fact so yeah it's a great match all right or was it sunday I, I don't know now anyway they're talking about to, about both of them because they both thought their careers were over at some point and they'd fight odds and it and they defied expectations of medical professionals, and they were now they are now fighting better than they had at any time before their before their careers were cut short. So that's why that was an important match, and I think that ended in a no contest. No, actually, he won the fight by. Uh, Okay. So after that happened, I wanted to shake hands with Brian. They shook hands. 
So Brian Danielson wanted to test himself against No, Will Osprey wants to test himself against Brian Danielson. But before that happens, because that's next month on the 21st, he's going to have to go against Shibata tonight. That's why it's such an important match. And from what Ted DiBiase said on his podcast about him, about Osprey, then this is even more important than before, because now we get to see can this act, can a story actually be told by by Osprey? Because we already know Brian can tell a story in the ring, but can but can Osprey tell a story? That is the biggest question about Osprey, and I I too felt the same way. So that's why I want to see this, is to see not only who wins, but but what story is being told. Because every time I look back at the old videos, I see what's lacking today is storytelling. And I mean, I'm just, I mean, nothing against AEW wrestlers. It doesn't look as pretend. It doesn't look as force fit. It doesn't look like it's written for them. But at the same time, a lot of people coming into the company don't understand about storytelling with what they do in the ring, so it's very hard for them to tell a story based off of that. So now that I said everything that I know about, and, uh, okay, I don't think there's anything else besides that a manager, yeah. Chris Statlander Goes against no. She she goes against her tag team partner and best friend Ola Nightingale, and Sky Blues, one of their nemesis at the moment, and Anna J, in a four way in a four way match. And Mercedes Monet, formerly known as Sasha Banks, is going to be on commentary too. Okay. Anything else? They even announced that this Saturday on Collision is gonna be the start of a TNT Open Challenge, Open Challenge, TNT Championship Open Challenge by Adam Copeland. Excuse me. It's gonna be at the Budweiser Gardens in London, Ontario, this Saturday night. Along with that. Um, tag team title tournament match I already mentioned. Thank you and goodbye.